Welcome to the Business of Being You podcast, a podcast about authenticity and the different ways people choose to be authentic. My name is Marco Benitez, also known as Coach Marco B. I'm a life and small business coach specializing in authenticity. In this podcast, you'll listen to my conversations with people who in their own way are being authentic. My goal with this podcast is to inspire you to be yourself confidently, to motivate you to take a chance on your ideas and dreams, and to provide you with a new perspective on how your unique qualities could be exactly what you've been looking for to create a life or business that inspires you and others. This is podcast season two, episode four, Authenticity and Acting. If you've ever wanted to be an actor or an actress, if your authentic self, your true self is calling you to go into the performing arts, then this is the episode for you. I'm excited today to have a conversation with Gloria Garayua. Gloria is an actress and an acting coach with over 20 years of experience and over 60 IMDb credits to her name. She's been in films including Fun with Dick and Jane starring Jim Carrey and Mother and Child. She's been in a multitude of TV spots including How to Get Away with Murder, Grey's Anatomy, The Good Doctor, Castle, Bones, Rizzoli and Isles, Shameless, Weeds, Six Feet Under, The Shield, Reckoning, and Made. She's done theater work, voiceover work, she sings, she dances, fluent in Spanish, intermediate in French, plays the piano, she slices, she dices, she julienne fries. Gloria, do you know how to julienne fries? <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course, yes. All right, nobody likes to show off, Gloria. But anyway, honestly, jokes aside, Gloria, thank you for being here. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Marco, for having me. Awesome. So let's just start with the question that I ask everyone. To you, what is authenticity? To me, authenticity is being yourself and knowing who you are and just showing up in the world as that without letting outside influences disturb who or what that is. You know, I found this topic to be interesting, which is why I reached out to you, because there's an interesting irony in acting and authenticity. Because authenticity is to be yourself, but acting is to portray others. How do you find that those two go together? I think you have to be able to know yourself in order to play someone else, to play another character, because you've got to be able to find parallels. Um, when you can find parallels, then you can identify with the character that you're portraying, which allows uh, sincere authenticity as opposed to putting it on, right? And then you've got to be able to find those elements that, where you contrast the character so that you can figure out how to understand the psychology of that person, why they do what they do, because you cannot, you cannot play with the contrast. You have to sort of give in to them. Um, so if I'm playing a bully and I know I'm not a bully, I've got to figure out what, why that bully operates the way that they do. And then I've got to find how I can connect to that. And you can almost find a way. If it's not coming from within, then I usually look at external sources. Like I'll look at a family member or a friend, or I might look at a prototype on television. But as an artist, I've got to be able to get inspired, right? So I'm constantly looking for that inspiration, whether it's from within, like my imagination, or my experiences, or whether it's from outside of me. But yeah, to go back to your question, you've, you've got to be, you've got to know who you are first in order to be able to portray a character. How did your acting journey begin? I like to start in the beginning because as I mentioned, the, the goal of the podcast is to inspire people to take a chance on their ideas and dreams and to really start to identify that maybe their unique qualities are exactly what they've wanted uh, all along, what they've been looking for all along. So for you, how did your acting journey begin? How did you start off? Where did you grow up? I grew up in the Bronx and um, New York. Um, and my acting journey began just playing around in school. I wasn't quite sure I wanted to be an actress. I just knew I enjoyed this. And when it came to extracurricular activities I, activities, I just could do whatever my parents could afford and what was available to me. So acting was just something that was around, right? I could do plays at school for free. And so I, I played around with that and I discovered I loved it. I was good at it. And if you think about it, we all have some trace of that in our childhood, right? Um, imagining a best friend or playing with our brothers and sisters and imagining what's around us. Right. Um, imagination is just very... Uh, innate to all of us. So I just took that and ran with it. And then when I was a little older, I wanted to be an actor, but I was very, very nervous about that. Um, I didn't think it could be taught. For some reason, I just had it in my head that 
you either were an actor or you weren't. Right? Mm. So in my brain, I thought, well, I'll just be a doctor. This acting thing is just a hobby. Right. Um, and then there was a moment in my childhood where things really aligned with acting and it happened in high school. I was in the Wizard of Oz and I was playing the lion, which I couldn't believe I got cast as a lion because I was so quiet and the lion needs you to be loud. Even though the lion is nervous, right. there are moments we have to be able to roar, right? right. And I, I just didn't know how to do that, but I thought, okay, it's a character. I have permission to act this way. So I'm going to just act this way. And it turns out that my French teacher was in the audience and during intermission, she came over to me and she said, I can't believe that was you. I had no idea that was you under the big mane. Um, you're, you've always been so quiet in class and look what you're capable of. You know, I really believed that that was someone else. And that was just a moment of clarity for me of, wow, I really did fool someone. And I'm, I'm good at this. Good. Right. <laughs> and that, that just really helped my confidence. And then from then on, I decided, okay, acting is what I want to do. So, and you know, cause we know each other from college. So I enrolled in, in um, acting in right. college right. yeah so that's how my acting journey began <laughs> just playing around just playing yeah what is the indicator that this can be more than a hobby because i think there has to be a lot of self-confidence behind it but for you what was that indicator where this might actually be something that i could run with oh i know there's nothing else i can do because <laughs> when it comes to acting i become uh just fully encompassed by it I mean, it consumes me. So when I think of a character, it honestly just feels like a, a whole other Gloria. Um, I think about the circumstances they're in, the relationships of the people in their scenes, their environment. I'm just so consumed by the world of that character that that's how I know, that's my indicator that I found the right thing to throw myself into because People who do it as a hobby have a very superficial look at acting. I, um, I happen to coach too, so I know. <laughs> People just perhaps look at the words. That's as far as that goes, but yeah. not with me. Like once I'm in a character, I'm really in a character. And um, that's why that kind of goes back to your original question of authenticity is you've got to know who you are because I got to know who I'm returning to, right? Like at the end of the day, right. I don't want to take home that character. Right. Um, I guess there are some extraneous circumstances where you might stay in the character a little longer. Mm. Um, but, you know, you've got to be able to wrap out of that. And you said something that's very interesting to me because you mentioned how sometimes it's tough to get out of the character. And I heard a story, and I don't know if it's urban legend, but I heard a story once that Heath Ledger, when he was preparing for the role of the Joker, apparently, again, I don't know if this is true, Jack Nicholson reached out to him and told him to be very careful with this character because this was the this is a character which could really draw you in. I don't know if that's true, but my question to you is, do you find that there's truth in that idea that people, well, the actors, can be so immersed into a character that they actually have difficulty coming out of it, that they, be, that they stay as this person? Oh, I know that for a fact. Um because you've got to play some brain tricks to get into certain characters. I mean, for example, just being able to manipulate crying. If you can authentically connect to whatever the circumstances are of the character, the words you're saying, crying is easily triggered. Um, and once you succeed at the scene, you, you should, if you're, I think, a healthy individual, be able to snap back into who you are. But there are characters that, let's say, for example, I'm cast as a lead and I know that the shoot is going to be a month or two long or I'm the series regular on an episodic and we're doing this for several weeks in a row. Sometimes you go home with this. I mean, you're spending all day with it, right? So it's hard to snap out. And if the character is particularly hard to get back into, you might keep a, a, a lifeline open. Right, so that yes, you can still have relationships with your friends and family, but you still feel very connected to the character. So within a few hours, you can go back on set and, and connect again. So it is really hard to fully snap out. I think it depends on the length that you're playing for, the depth of the character. For example, if I just do a co-star or a guest star, I know that maybe it's just a one day thing. 
and going into it, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I, I shouldn't really lose myself. Um, but yeah, there have been some characters where I know I've got to give in for a certain period of time and it's hard to keep a social life and still go into work and do this amazing job. That's why I often, I actually close myself off to the world, <laughs> um, which is a rather sad and lonely life, but many actors will tell you that. Um, but I know if I'm working on something and I want the result to be a certain way, I don't want to be influenced by outside people. And also I don't want to feel like I have to justify what I'm doing because this is my art and, and it's, it's what I've chosen to do. So, um, you know, sometimes I'll run lines as I'm walking around the block and people might think she's crazy. She's talking to herself. Although who knows now, nowadays people might think, oh, she's on the phone, but um, it's what I'm doing, right? Uh, it's how I practice. So yeah, some characters are hard to get into. So you have to stay really strongly connected. So as far as the Joker, I can fully understand that because that character's, uh, I don't want to use the word crazy because I don't believe in crazy. There's justifications for everything. It's just, they're outside of the realism that most other people are comfortable with, right? right. Um, and so a character like that would have to take 110% of you to just devote yourself to. I mean, I think of Lady Gaga, who I really liked in House of Gucci. And, you know, she said she never got out of the Italian accent. And I can fully understand that because it might be hard to snap back in. And also, if you want to fully focus on your acting and not be concerned with the accent, then the accent has to become such second nature that you, your actual focus is on what you want it to be on. Um, like I do voiceovers and whenever I have to do an accent, which I'm not good at, the accent takes effort. And all of a sudden my acting becomes secondary and I never want it to be that way. So yeah, I fully understand why someone would say that it's hard to snap in and out of a character. Right. Which was the most difficult for you or the most immersive for you? Um, it's usually theater as opposed to TV and film. I feel like there's more challenges in, in, in um, theater. Like I might get cast as a character that I don't look like because from far away, it, no one would know the difference. They can put me in hair and makeup or a, a wardrobe that would make me look that way. With TV and film, the camera is so close that unless you have the budget for super great prosthetics or a great you know, special effects team, um, you can't really pull that same thing off. So challenges for me were mostly when I do theater. Like for example, in college, I was in The Tempest, Shakespeare's The Tempest, and my character was a, a, a fairy. And so I remember just how, thinking about how can I portray something that's not human? How do I portray something that's grounded and yet ethereal? So you, you, you do a lot of research, you read a lot of things, you have a lot of images to draw from, and then you start feeling like your DNA has shifted. You just, you don't feel the same. And that's when you know you've immersed yourself into something different. And that's a perfect example of a character that's hard to snap out of because all that work that it gets to get into it, I can't imagine completely disconnecting and mm -hmm. then having to do it again. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I would kind of carry around with me. It's also like when I coach and I tell my students, if you've got to cry for a scene, you might have to prep that in advance and then kind of hold it in your heart for a little bit. But then you release when the time is right. And so it's a skill that I've just learned to, to, <laughs> to be good at, like right. prepping in advance for something and then holding it until it's time to release. Right. <laughs> I don't know if that's healthy, but <laughs> um, that's why actors, I really do think, need outlets because we're doing things that in the real world, we're taught to not do. For example, we're supposed to breathe in real life and let things go, right? Or perhaps heal from trauma. But in acting, you kind of want those traumas because you want things to draw from. And you don't always want to let go of something because you could always pull, pull that memory up later and use it. Um, I have a lot of non-actor friends in my life because I think it's healthy to have that balance, but the people that I think have understood me the most in my life are other artists. So right. <laughs> I found my tribe. <laughs> right, right. I've said for a while, and you tell me what you think about this statement, that there are some people in movies that are good actors and there are others that are not necessarily actors, but they're just a character themselves that works best for that role. Would you agree with that? Yes. Um, 
like, you know, Jim Carrey comes to mind back in the 90s. Everyone kept casting him as the funny man, the guy who's really silly and doesn't mind looking silly and thinking outside the box. But then his work evolved and I saw him in drama and he's so good. So I do wonder if in life there are some people that chose to just use one side of their education or training as actors because that's where they found success and that's that's where they know they're going to make some money but yet there is another side of them that they're trained to do and they're well-rounded actors but maybe they're shy to show that because they have found success in the other side but then there are those who throw caution to the wind and just see where the chips fall um like i have found success thank god in drama and in comedy but uh i could understand having to make an income in this world right and so if if someone goes, well, Gloria cries really well, let's keep casting her in drama. I'm going to say yes, because I want the work, but I know I've got this great comedic side. So it takes a lot of strength and bravery to accept those comedic auditions and show people that side of me because it's less explored, less accepted, but you've got to put yourself out there other ways. <laughs> no one's going to know that you right. have this other skill. Um, so yeah, there are some skills that can be taught and then used, but you never know. I mean, when it comes to acting, sometimes people only explore a certain asset to themselves. Like, okay, I'm really good at comedy. I'm only going to do comedy or I don't like drama. So they've shut the door to that. You can, you can learn other tricks and do other things. Um, so really that question is difficult to answer because it depends on the talent. Someone just might be good at one particular thing. Right. Uh, for example, like I get inquiries all the time for my coaching. What do you teach? Do you only teach drama? And that question has always thrown me just because I know that I I'm good at everything. So like, yeah. I can, I can teach on comedy and TV and film and, and other stuff. And I go, wow, are there other coaches out there that are one trick ponies? Cause that just doesn't make any sense to me. You've got to be able to have a finger in, in every fire. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, there are some people that can only do one thing, but it, it can be taught. And then those that have this ability to do multiple things. I don't know why they would hold on to something and not let themselves shine in all aspects. I don't know. Right. I mean, just yesterday I was at a musical audition and I haven't auditioned for theater in a while because I, you know, found success in TV and film, but I put myself out there and I sang in front of folks and, <laughs> you know, and, and I came home smiling because I did that. And I promised myself, no matter what happened, have fun because at, at the end of the day, I might not get cast, right. but I wanted to come home knowing I did something different today and something cool and something that took bravery as opposed to the usual that I'm already used to, which for some folks, they might say, Gloria, what you do is already on the edge, right? right. And I get that, but it's, it's not on the edge for me anymore, right? Putting myself on camera and crying or whatever else I'm doing. But theater, yeah, because it's been a while, especially with the pandemic, it interrupted theater more than it did um, anything that uses the camera. So that was fun. <laughs> do you find that each character draws upon a different part of yourself or is it that um, you lose yourself and then you become a character or is it a balance somewhere no. between the two? I think it's the first. I mean, yes, you might be able to lose yourself and stumble upon something and build on it. But no, I think for the most part, if you're able to portray something, it's because there's an element inside of you that is that, whether or not you've explored it. Um, and of course that happens all the time. Like you're going to get characters that have all these specific details that are not you, but as you sit there with it and you try to find connections, you'll, you'll find them. You know, I did say that earlier, you can, you can draw from your own life experience or from external, but a lot of being an actor is soul searching, like really just going deep and asking yourself, well, how, how can I identify with that? And that's one of the beautiful things I love about acting is because I know that I'm a, I'm a full well, and that's what you're supposed to be when you're an actor so that you have things to pull from. And when you live a very narrow or, or small world uh, life, what are you going to draw from, right? So as artists, you're constantly, I'm always seeing movies, TV, theater, I go out. Um, I haven't been to a museum in a while, but I have gone to a few exhibits lately, which is similar but different right. and these things are filling me constantly you so yeah we talked about before we started recording how I mostly am working from home right. but I still have to find a way to fill my well you've played a few detective roles 
in your career. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm going to draw upon your detective roles, and I'm going to ask you about stuff that you said, just like your detectives have inquired their suspects. And didn't you say this? So I'm going to do the same with you right now, okay? This oh, was boy. not, this is, this is curveball, so let's see how you go. But don't worry, these are, these are your words. Oh, God. Here we go. You ready? No. You're not ready. <laughs> That's okay. So ready or not. Learn how to act smart by embracing the artist within you and learn to make strong choices that have your unique signature on it. Okay. You said that. Yes. Tell me about that. I did say that. That is my motto when I teach because I am finding way too many folks are asking for permission. And honestly, nothing makes me more upset <laughs> because as an artist, you cannot ask for permission. That makes you a non-artist in my eyes. I don't know what that is. That's, a, that's, that's someone who's scared. And you have to show up with your interpretation and your originality and how you see the character and allow them to just experience that. So you have to show up with 100%. Or let's say 95%, right? Because there's always some questions you might have about the storyline or the character itself. Um, or maybe some things just haven't been figured out or there's some nerves, <laughs> right? And nerves might stop the full process from continuing, but you still have to show up with your choices made. And then you have to show them and them, of course, is whoever is casting. And, and for your audience, that could be the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, who, who you've developed. And when we hold back, there's no full commitment there. So it's really hard to assess what we're watching or judging if there's not a full presence in front of us um now with little ones because of course i coach all ages with the little ones i get it you know they're still figuring themselves out and with adults there could be some childhood traumas there that are keeping them insecure but when it comes to taking on a character i mean you already have permission to be that person so just develop that person the way you want them to be and let them show up um, I've heard writers say that sometimes scripts write themselves. You know, you just get inspired and the words just pour. I feel very much the same way when it comes to acting. That's why improvising as a character shouldn't be difficult if you feel like you know that character and what they would say or do. You mentioned about teaching kids, and this is um, something you said. I was watching a, a clip of your one of your lessons, uh, one of your acting lessons, uh, which Loved it. I, I think you have definitely a charisma for this, and I think you have a, a gift for this. You said, I let you stand here for about 30 seconds because we're in a performing art, and you need to get used to being stared at. You need to get used to being comfortable in your own skin, having people expecting something of you. I love that so much because I was so uncomfortable, and I think a lot of people are, in front of groups. And this is not just acting advice, this is public speaking advice, this is life advice. Uh, if you're a server at a restaurant, this is advice that would be relevant to them. Tell me about that. Well, first of all, kudos to you for being a great researcher. That <laughs> is impressive. Um, I, I know I said that because that sounds like something I would say. <laughs> um, although I am curious where you found that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, as a detective, uh, I cannot reveal my sources. <laughs> wow. I, yeah, I do say that. So what I mean by that is, um, okay, usually that comes in the lesson where I teach neutral position. So I'm even doing it now. I'm shifting in my seat, right? Um, because I know I'm, I'm in the hot seat, right? I'm on the spotlight. So there's a certain level of pressure that comes with that. And so I've had to train myself to be comfortable with stillness because there is power in stillness. There's less power in, in that, like in moving around, right? I'm, I'm letting my power be diffused. It's just kind of spilling. But if I can contain my power and how I control the release of that energy, then I should be interesting to watch. I should be someone that is easy to trust. And you've got to allow people to see that you're capable of that if you want them to, let's say in the case of an actor, employ you. 
right? Cast you in a role, pay you lots of money to show up on set and do something that is based on emotions. Right. <laughs> um, but of course, like you said, that is relatable in many other fields. Being able to stand in your truth is one way of saying it. But I like to think of it like a tree where roots just grow from your feet down into the earth and you are grounded. Nothing's going to budge you or push you. Just knowing how you've shown up today and that you can't apologize for yourself. I mean, certain aspects, yeah, your behavior and things like that, but showing up as what you look like, what your body is today, what your face looks like today. Um, I mean, this is separate from etiquette and politeness and things like that, but I'm just saying like showing up with the knowledge that you have today, because mm -hmm. you know, we're always evolving and tomorrow I'll be a different person. I will hopefully know something I didn't know today. So being able to just not fidget, staying calm, and just uh, allowing your nervous system to relax puts you in a place where you can respond better to the stimuli around you. So if I'm in an audition and I'm feeling nervous, whatever they say to me, I may not respond as my true self. For example, I could be hilarious at a party around my friends, but in a circumstance where I'm feeling judged and I'm uncomfortable, my entire behavior changes. And in a world where they're gonna hire the person that is only not only right for the role, but also likable, fun to have on set, fun to be around, you've gotta be able to master that, that aspect of just relaxing and being who you are. Even if that is corny, right? Like I'm the queen of dad jokes. <laughs> um, but I always tell my students, wouldn't you rather a teacher that's corny than a teacher who doesn't make a joke at all? all right. So. I practice in my real life. I, I make corny jokes all day long. And then I kind of just like clock. Oh, that was a good one. You know, so <laughs> just little things like that. But that's what I meant by that. Like being able to stand still for 30 seconds trains the body that that is and can be normal. Uh, at first, it feels militaristic. It feels stiff. Um, it feels very unnatural. But there's a point where, you know, your arms by your side and you just being there is enough. Right. It is enough to just be you. So that's what that means. <laughs> right, right. And, and a lot of what you were talking about ties into this idea of authenticity. That's what you were basically saying. It's just be comfortable being your authentic self. This is who you are. You look how you look. You sound how you sound. This is how you are. So being comfortable in your authenticity. The other thing you mentioned, which is very interesting to me, is being comfortable with stillness. And I've done a couple of episodes so far. And the idea of being okay with silence and also being okay with eye contact has come up so far in, 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 I think, every episode so far. So this is very interesting to me because stillness and authenticity seem to have some kind of commonality. And as I mentioned, I have conversations with people in different, um, being authentic in different ways. So I find that very interesting. The quotables continues. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right. Don't okay, worry. that was you read my body language, <laughs> scratching my That's eyebrow. <laughs> All right, let's, that let's was, get that was to you it. <laughs> acting nervous, but you're not really nervous. All right. You also teach your students when entering a cast room to say hello, I am, and you emphasize to them that saying I am because that statement of I am is powerful. I agree with that. Tell me more about your thoughts on that I am statement. Yeah, I mean, as an adult, I've learned the power of that statement. Uh, I wasn't really taught that as a kid. So um, I like being able to empower people at a younger age, because I think it'll just set them up for more success sooner. <laughs> um, but you know, we grew up in a different generation. So it is what it is, right. But um, if you have a choice, and I think we always have a choice, if you have a choice to say my name is versus I am, I think I am a stronger. It's just it. For me, it feels like confidence in accepting who you are, right? Not the name I was given, but I instead, I currently identify with this name, right? right? So, so yeah, that's what I teach my, my students, no matter what the age is, is saying I am. And then the other thing is um, being able to fill in the blank after that is so special. So in that particular case, when they walk into a casting office, they would say their name, but in life, uh, we, we really should watch our words because there's power in words. And I've just learned that throughout the years um, because I think I used to be the kind of person that had 
no filter, <laughs> but that's because I didn't know any better. And you're also and from the I, Bronx, so. And I'm know, also from the Bronx, so you know, you're, you're, where people are very you're, direct. You're geographically uh, predisposed to less filtering. Thank you for, you know, helping me justify why <laughs> I was the way I was. But then you, you come to a different coast where there's more sensibilities right. and then you enter a world where it's all based on sensitivities as well, like emotions and, and people uh, can cry over the words you use. Right. And, and when you're in this position of coaching someone, people are very reliant on what you're saying. So I've just learned, there's always a kinder way of saying what you want to say. <laughs> and also how you say things like putting it in context, also how you frame it helps. Um, I'm not an expert at this, but I'm certainly better at this than I was. So the I am thing is very important to me because what you say after that, it could be a negative, it could be a positive, but we start to believe the things we say over and over again. And if you're saying it to others, you're starting to label them, I think subconsciously. And that's alarming because, you know, people get used to what they're hearing. Um, so there's a lot of crap that I've had to undo <laughs> as an adult from things that I heard as a kid. And, um, and so I'm, I'm trying to be responsible for the, the words that I use when speaking to others, because you are labeling, right? So, so I am is very, very powerful. I agree. I agree. <laughs> so you mentioned how it's important um, to be authentic to your students, you mentioned that to them. Do you, what tips do you give them for being authentic in the roles that they play? So for someone who's a beginner, and this would help someone who listening to this is considering going to the performing arts um, and they feel that they have to copy what other, what other actors have done in the past. What tips do you give to your students for being authentic in the roles that they play? Well, I also want them to be themselves first, but that's where the problem lies when you're dealing with little ones because there's no, they haven't identified those labels yet. Instead, they're being given those. So I'm not an empath like you, um, but I am instinctive. So I've gotten really good at meeting someone and within the first few seconds, being able to get a sense of who they are. And I can tell when someone's nervous or hiding you could just read body language, facial expressions. I mean, that's what I do for a living, right? So you can tell when someone hasn't quite shown you yet who they really are. So I do my best to relax them by just being me. And I think that helps. So that's going back to your point of authenticity, because if I don't know who I am, let's say I'm nervous, then geez, I'm hiding too. So we just got two people hiding. We're never going to get to portraying a character if we can't <laughs> start from a place of truth, right? So I try to be just easy going, make a joke. Um, and then eventually I, I feel people loosen up, relax, and then you get a sense of who they are. And once I feel like I know who someone is, at least just an idea, then I try to put that into the work. You know, like if I know someone has a great smile or a great laugh, or is usually really sharp on picking up cues, then I want to put that into the work. Um, if someone is very introspective and there's this element of being able to just pause, but analyze, then that's a beautiful thing too, that they can offer the work. You know, sometimes I'm coaching people on the same scene and I know that that can scare someone. Wait, you coached that person too on that scene, but everyone brings something different to the table. Mm. And so my coaching, and I think this is what sets me apart, is that <laughs> I'm not going to give the same direction to two different people. Um, because they're, they're coming from two different walks of life, right? So I'm basing my choices off of the person I have in front of me. Right. Yeah. So that's how I help. <laughs> if you couldn't act anymore and you couldn't coach actors anymore, what would you do? That scares me. Uh, <laughs> but I think that I would probably produce because um, I'm really organized, like like obsessed with organization. Um, I think that I could really put things together. <laughs> I haven't produced a film or a short yet. So being able to say that takes a lot of courage because I know producers and I know the work that goes into it. And anyone hearing that now is probably looking at me and going, well, how do you know you could do it if you've never done it? I just feel like I produced my life. I mean, before we recorded, I was telling you about my work schedule. If I can manage my time 
and all the people that I work with every single day, because I'm a collaborator. There's very few things I do by myself, unless it's a monologue. Um, but most things require another person. All day long, even though it's online, I'm working with other folks. Um, so yeah, I think it would be producing. Sometimes I think, can it be directing? It just depends because I, I think that a director has to have a very, very strong vision and it goes beyond just the vision. You've got to be able to articulate that in a way that others can also jump on board the train and understand that vision and help you bring it to life. I'm not quite sure that I have that yet. So I think it would be producing. <laughs> Which actors or actresses do you find most authentic and are they also your favorite? The people that I'm going to choose as most authentic happen to be my favorite. And I think that's why they're my favorite. It's because I feel like I know them, which of course um, I don't know them. <laughs> right. And I have to remind myself that um, because if I bumped into them on the street, I'm not going to reach out and hug them. Right. That's assault. <laughs> um, I've got to introduce myself, but it, it has happened to me where people have seen me on TV and then they come up to me and they feel like they know me. And it's really hard to handle that because some people go, how do I know you? And I know I don't know them. Right. They just know me from TV. Right. So I just try to handle that the way anyone would at, at a party. I'm not quite sure I know you. What's your name? And then, and then we get into the fact that I'm an actor. But to answer your question, I love Michelle Rodriguez like so much. Mm -hmm. I really, really want to work with her. And it's because I feel she's so authentic. Every interview I've seen with her, she doesn't feel like she's putting up a front at all. If she feels like smiling, awesome. If she doesn't, that's great too. I, and I embrace that as well. Um, in her roles, obviously she's showing up. I think she's a great actress. So she's showing up as the character. So she's not, she's not hiding behind anything. There's no fear to be whoever she's portraying. Um, over the years, I've, I've, grown to love J-Lo for her acting even more than at the beginning. In the beginning, I just liked her for her dancing and her singing because I love the music and all that. But as, as I see this beautiful woman getting even more beautiful <laughs> um, and just rocking her age and rocking her career, I'm like, wow, that to me is authenticity, you know, knowing who you are and just letting yourself blossom and shine, you know, because there's a lot of people out there that see you shine and they want to damper that but if you if you know you can't do anything other than shine right you got to let yourself do the thing that you are and I see her doing that and I just I love her for that too um so yeah I chose two Latin females isn't that interesting That's um interesting. but <laughs> there's other cultures and genders that I I admire too but those two pop to mind yeah right. My favorite actor of all time is, is Robin Williams. And I always had this, this dream to meet him one day. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, he passed away, you know, too soon. Um, but I, I just love that guy's work. You know, I remember seeing as a kid, I remember seeing uh, um, I think my mom rented the, the Popeye movie. That was, I think, like was, was one of his first roles. And then uh, just like you mentioned with Jim Carrey, he started out with a lot of comedic stuff. And when he started sharing this, his, his dramatic roles, when he started starting these drama movies, like, well, Dead Poet Society, um, What Dreams Good May Will Come. Hunting. Oh, Good Will Hunting. What Dreams May Come is one of my favorite movies ever. Um, yeah, man. It's like one of my life's frustrations that I never had the chance to meet him. You know, his role in Patch Adams was one of the catalysts for me to really pursue my career in medicine. Um, yeah, yeah, I watched it. And I watched it in, in college a couple of times also. I, 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 think my, uh, I think my mother gifted me the DVD when I was in college. She sent me a care package and it was, it was in there. And I remember when there was these classes, which just seemed impossible to, to, to memorize everything there. I remember on those nights, I would just watch, um, I, would, I would watch the movie and it kind of gave me that, that, that motivational boost that I needed to keep pushing because I know there was a bigger goal at the end. So. I love hearing that just because I love hearing that art did that for you. Oh. And that is what art is supposed to oh, do, inspire, absolutely. motivate. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I find that God, the universe, speaks to me through music and movies, mostly. Like I receive God's messages through music and movies a lot. Um, I'll pick out little details, little scenes that 
maybe just pass by and it doesn't mean anything to anyone. But for me, I'll just, I'll rewind and I'll get fixated on it. And there, there's deeper meaning to a lot of these things. I had this idea once to, not this idea once, I, I have an intention to buy um, a Bumblebee uh, Transformer figure because that character, the way Michael Bay portrayed Bumblebee, um, for me mimics a lot of, of how I receive the message. Bumblebee doesn't speak on his own voice. He would speak through the, the clips and the snippets in the radio, if you remember, you know, in, in the Transformer. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, so if you watch the Transformers movies, there'll be a, a clip from uh, Apollo, whatever, Apollo 13, and then he'll, he'll uh, uh, have like a clip from a song, you know, and they, they make some of it's funny, some of it's more sending a message. Um, but I had this idea one day I'm going to buy myself a little uh, a bumblebee figure and just put it there as my, as my representation of how God in the universe speaks to me through, through media. Um, and, and I'm, well, who knows if the bumblebee just finds its way into your life? Like, what if someone gifted you that and you're like, oh my God, that, I was just thinking that. That would be, you, that you would can be attract amazing. the bumblebee into your life. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, with my luck, um, I'll attract the real bumblebee and I'll get stung. But. <laughs> <laughs> you reminded me of John uh, Baptiste, who just won like a million Grammys. Because uh, he, I just watched him in an interview saying that God speaks to him through music mm. too. And that music doesn't need to be made. It just, it does itself. Like it's in charge of itself and it speaks to us. Wow. So that's so interesting. Uh, if you don't know who he is, you should look him up. Wow. I've heard the, Yeah, I've heard the name. I haven't listened to the music. But yeah, I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And it's funny when, when you were describing earlier um, some of the way that you get into roles where you just kind of let it take you. And then right now when you were describing uh, John Baptiste, right, his name? Uh, mm -hmm. in, in my coaching training, we, we were trained in what they call energetic levels of self-perception. And they range from one to seven. And so I won't bore you with all the details of each one. But there is what they call the level seven, which is godlike energy, where it's you're kind of detached from your body. And when you're simultaneously the participant, participant and the observer at the same time. And I've had moments like that. People can't exist in level sevens for, for, for very long. Um, I've had those moments where sometimes I'm speaking with someone from the heart. And I, I get a sensation almost like I pull back and up. And I, I feel that simultaneous observer and participant. And what's really funky is that sometimes in those moments, the words that are coming out of my mouth are the first time that I'm hearing them as well. And as the words are coming out of my mouth, I'm like, man, this is some really good stuff. You know, I got to write <laughs> this down. Like, where is this coming from? It's like straight download. Um, they've described people who are women who are giving birth or people that get that runner's high, these athletes, when they're in the zone, they're euphoric. Uh, so I, I, I could totally understand what he was saying in that music just flows, just let it mm. flow. That makes me think of a performer's high, which I've definitely experienced. I experience it more in theater than I do in TV and film. And I think that's because there's a momentum that theater has that TV and film doesn't because TV and film just naturally by by the nature of how it works, is very choppy. Um, whereas theater, it's from go time to curtain, you're going, right? So when you're done, it's really hard to stop. That's why like when you, when you are a theater actor like Broadway or, or any other uh, theater, <laughs> you don't go to sleep right away. You're done at like, oh, let's say 11 p.m. usually with most shows and then you gotta come down. Um, so, you know, when you do theater, you're like up for a while after that. Yeah, yeah. 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 So there is a thing called performer's high and I've experienced it. So I can relate in that way. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I've had similar experiences when I, I was at a, when I, when I did my coaching training, like this program was, it was so amazing and it was so energetically intense at moments. And I understand that, that concept of you need time to come down. It wasn't a come down in a bad way. It's like I have to just almost like I have to re-enter my body and be in this present world again because I, I wasn't here for a little bit. I remember yeah. at, the, at the end of, of one of my, my training modules and we went deep, man. We went deep. We started hitting on some stuff, which was like pulls you out of where you are. And I remember that I was meeting up with someone after and they said, oh, well, you want me to send a, a you know, let, why don't you take an Uber back? And I said, no, I'm going to walk from, from, the, from the train to your house. And this was like a far walk. This was like a two-mile walk. 
So I was like, I'm going to walk it because I need that time. And sure enough, I really did. Like the whole train ride, I was just like zombie status, you know, just kind of blank stare, just kind of just, you feel like a mild vibration and warmth in your body. And it's just like, all right, I got to come down. And the walk over those two miles kind of brought me back to myself. And oh, then yeah. I could be, you know, but, you're, totally but you're like that. mellowed yeah. out when you're in the new space. And it still takes a little bit. Once you start engaging with people, that kind of finalizes that coming back to, to, to where you were. So. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's funny, right? How in, yeah. in different ways we can we can share that similar experience. Yeah, I did meet Robin Williams, not one on one, but I was working as an extra. Oh, back in the day when oh, wow. I did background work, um, he what was the name of it? It was called House of D. Yes, David Duchovny. Was I in saw it. that movie. And I saw that movie. You did. I did. I'm, I'm just an extra. I don't even think I saw myself when I saw that movie. So, so don't bother watching it thinking you'll see me. <laughs> But anyway, I was in background holding and Robin Williams came in and we were all surprised because most people don't care about the background actors, right? Which is a terrible thing. And he walks in and he says hello to everyone. And of course we all gather around. And in those days we didn't have cell phones or maybe we did, I don't know, but it wasn't like today. Um, So no one was really videotaping him. We were just experiencing him. And so everyone kind of naturally made a circle around him and, and, and he was dressed in his wardrobe, which was this like bright um, fluorescent suit. And he was just cracking jokes. Of course. I mean, what yeah. would we expect? But, but it just, I thought to myself, guy, you know, he's in between takes. Instead of going to his trailer or grabbing a snack or going to the bathroom, he's in here with us right. performing. Doesn't he need a break? Right. And I, it was just really amazing. Um, but that just goes to show he was operating at that level. Right. I mean, some people just never turn off and maybe that's, you know, the flip side, why he was depressed because right. it's hard to operate at that level or have those expectations put on you all the time. Right. Yeah. I saw a documentary about him recently and it seems like it was a lot more than depression. Unfortunately, the poor guy was sick. The poor guy was sick. He had a Louis body dementia. Um, but man, what a gift. What a gift that guy! And then it's funny just experiencing him. I think that's a, that's that's awesome. I could totally get that. Never met the guy, like I said, but I think that's that's such an awesome story. So, switching gears, I want to I want to hit you with some more questions. No more quotes, thank God. Okay. No, we're done with the <laughs> quotables. That was that was it. You did well. I have some. I have a few more. Would you like me to go back to the quotables? No, that's okay. We'll skip, we'll skip the quote of us. Because I'm just like, what did I say? <laughs> okay. What ha- I'll take your question. What ha- happened was, <laughs> so, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with lightning round. Just real quick answers, just because I'm just curious. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's see. What was your most challenging role? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, I've done so many roles. Let's see. My most challenging role. Oh, you want me to answer fast? Sure. I'm not supposed to think. No. I think it was my most recent one, which was made on Netflix. And it, uh, I only say it was most difficult because of the nature of the filming process. Um, we were filming still in the midst of COVID and there was quarantining involved. And my role was only supposed to film a day or two, but they were shooting multiple episodes at once, which ma- made scheduling difficult. So I was pretty much on hold for about six weeks, which is a really long time to be away from home in a hotel, in another country, because we filmed in Canada, in a city that is pretty much shut down because of COVID. Um, So, you know, you don't know anyone. If you do go outside, there's nowhere to go. Um, So that was just really a difficult thing to shoot just because personally, when I wasn't on set, I, you know, was just dealing with myself. (laughs) Like, what do I do with myself? And Um, I threw myself into my other side business, which is coaching, but that comes with its harms as well, because I was sitting a lot coaching multiple people in a row and I wasn't getting a lot of exercise and I wasn't getting a lot of outside stimulation or sunlight. So it was just, it was just rough time for me. (laughs) And then I am called to set and I'm supposed to do my job. The nerve, the nerve of it. (laughs) <laughs> it's just tricky it's just tricky so yeah you bring up a good point you know it's it's silly to complain about but it's you know as actors and I always tell my students this 
we're not performing monkeys. You don't just twirl the little thing behind us and we go. We have to feel stimulation and inspiration and it just wasn't happening. So when it was time for me to show up on set, it was hard to do what I had to do because by then the run through for them was almost done and the crew just really knew each other. They were well bonded and I'm just a guest in their house right. and I'm supposed to perform at optimum. And, and it just took a lot to get there. What was your most fun experience? My most fun experience was We're still um, in the lightning round, by the way, just shoot them out. That's I'm it. already failing lightning <laughs> round. <laughs> So, uh, it's all right. reckoning. You're, you're being authentic. Sh- you're being authentic. You're you're an elaborator, which is fine. Uh, I forgot we got out of interview mode. Um, reckoning on Netflix was my most favorite thing because I was series regular and I got to work a lot. What was your most fulfilling experience? I don't know. Oh, okay. I did a pilot that didn't get picked up. That was very fulfilling because I felt like I made a dream come true. What's your favorite movie or TV show to watch? My cousin Vinny, <laughs> which totally ages me. That's a um, good movie, though. But That's I love it because it's so funny. I mean, yeah. you know, Joe Pesci and Marissa Tomei. And um, anyway, so, yeah, that's my favorite movie. TV show? My favorite TV show? I'm just going to make it current. Um, the Morning Show. Just because I think the actors on that are phenomenal. It is good. What's your dream gig? Um, my dream gig is doing comedy and being... Uh, the lead of a ABC or Disney or Nickelodeon show. I just, I've always wanted to do children's programming. Um, so if I could do something wholesome, that would be so nice and different from what I usually do. <laughs> Cause I don't do a lot of wholesome stuff. <laughs> what advice do you have for someone who wants to get into acting or who's currently acting, but wants to get into coaching? For anyone who wants to get into acting, I would say stop talking about it and do it because there are so many different levels. I mean, you could just jump into a play, you can jump to a a community or church experience, or you could um, audition for a short, which is, uh, doesn't take a lot of time. And um, for someone who wants to learn to coach, I would say, well, start small. So small little sections of learning how to balance um, what you're receiving and what you're giving. That was lightning round too, that question? No, we moved away. Oh, okay, okay, because I could expand on that. You want me to expand on that? Is it authentic to you to expand? Or do you <laughs> want <laughs> No, I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> How can people follow you and what you're doing? Uh, before we get to that, what are you working on now, if you can share that? Because I know that they make you guys sign these NDAs and stuff. So I'm just oh, curious, what are you working um... on now? Everything that is current is, I think, just wrapped. So I was working on something called new media. I don't even know what kind of contract that, that is for, it, for people that are not in the industry. But essentially, I'm saying that because I don't know where it's going to end up. Um, it's streaming for sure. Uh, but it was called Linked by Love. It was several episodes. And it was a character that I created 11 years ago that is now making a comeback <laughs> in like a reboot. <laughs> so there's that. Um, and also I do a lot of dubbing work for voiceover. So I'm in the midst of doing some Netflix projects uh, and I'm constantly auditioning. They're constantly auditioning. So I don't know, maybe something will come up for my recent auditions. And I think that's it. <laughs> how, yeah. can, how can people follow you, what you're doing, uh, if they wanna work with you as a coach or if they wanted to hire you for acting, um, how can they reach out to you? So if people just want to check out what I'm doing, then Instagram is a great place to go because I'm very active on there. I'm not very active on the other ones. I do post occasionally on Facebook. Twitter, I got off of completely, really. Um, <laughs> so Instagram, Gloria Gary Yua. And then if someone's interested in uh, coaching with me, I actually would rather they email me. So Gloria Gary Yua at gmail.com. Can you spell That's the last us. name for everyone? Yes, G-A-R-A-Y-U-A. Uh, occasionally people ask me for coaching on social social media platforms and those messages get missed often because um, I'm on there a lot just to post but I'm not really digging through so I'd rather they email me for that Gloria thank you so much for being a part of this episode this was fun uh, it's it's nice to see how you've grown in, in your career like you mentioned we've known each other since college and so I think it's it's really been exciting for me to see you uh, grow in your career 
And as I mentioned to you before we started recording, it's always funny how randomly I'll watch a show and I'm like, oh yeah, that's Gloria, you know, and you know, I knew her from before. <laughs> Uh, but thank you for taking the time out for being on the podcast. Uh, I appreciate you sharing your experience. I appreciate you sharing your advice. And I'm confident that what you share today is going to inspire someone who wants to go into acting, um, essentially the, having them pull the trigger and just do it. Because you mentioned something very common that other people have mentioned. And it's that you're never going to feel 100% ready. You just got to get out there and do it. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank you for having me. It's been so much fun to talk to you and just see you again. You're aging very well. <laughs> thank you. I have, I have so. the filter on on the recording. A touch up appearance. <laughs> I love it. And I will hit you up when I'm in New York. And, and you're supposed to be coming out to LA. So hit yes. me up when you come here. You got it.